we think about Jesus specifically with the many titles that the New Testament assigns him, what typically comes to mind? Usually, I would say Savior, maybe Mediator, perhaps Intercessor, and probably Lamb of God. But we find in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, a different title that our Lord has. And that is the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Root of David. I would like for us to, in the next few minutes, study out this idea of the Lion of the tribe of Judah as it's applied to Jesus Christ. First, we need to look at really this term's history. And we find it basically with the naming and the blessing of Judah, the patriarch. We see that Judah was the fourth son of Leah, Genesis chapter 29, verses 32 through 35. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and then Judah were born to her. In Genesis chapter 29, verse 35, we find, it says, and she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. Thus, we find the Hebrew word used for Judah means praise or that which is celebrated. This is echoed in the blessing from his father Jacob in Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 10. There it's recorded that in verse 8 says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. We see from this blessing from his father that Judah is told that he will be praised by his brethren. He will be able to dominate his enemies. He is compared to a lion and he will ultimately possess authority. Now, the scepter that's referenced here, which Judah would possess, is not that of a king. Instead, it refers more to the staff of a tribal leader a tribal staff. Now we know that each tribe had its own rod or staff and it represented authority. On this staff that the tribal leader would have would be inscribed the name of that uh, respective tribe. Thus the tribal identity of Judah would not pass until Shiloh would come. Now this word Shiloh, of course, means peace or even sent one. It is used to refer to the Messiah. Now, after this Messiah came, then Judah would lose his tribal identity. Shiloh would also command the obedience of countless people. Now, with this in mind, let us compare this to Jesus. We want to note the relationship between Judah and Jesus. We know from scripture that Jesus is the physical descendant of Judah. We find the genealogy of Jesus in Luke chapter 3. A similar passage would be Matthew chapter 1 verse 3. But in verse 33 of Luke 3, it's said that we find reference to Judah, the son of Jacob, being a forefather of Jesus. The Hebrews writer confirms this as well. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. There it says, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. As we pointed out, Judah, that word means praise. The patriarch Judah would be praised as head of the tribe. Much more so, Jesus, the only begotten of the Father, our Savior is worthy of praise, honor, and glory. 
much more so than that of Judah, his forefather. One reason is because Jesus is this Shiloh that was promised aforetime. As this Shiloh, Jesus would bring about the loss of the identity of Judah. Consider how we see that history unfolded. Galatians chapter 3, verses 22 through 29. Again, Galatians chapter 3, verses 22 through 29. Paul records there, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law of Moses, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. We note then the design and purpose of the Old Testament. From this passage, we see that it was designed to bring the Jew to Christ. It was a schoolmaster. Commonly, it's described today as more or less as the bus driver, um, for our school school days, it was the one who would bring the child to the school to where they would be able to learn. Once this Christ would come, or Shiloh, there would be no more need for the Old Testament. We know it was nailed to the cross of Christ, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. And we see that faith in Christ is what would be able to make children of God. This was finally completed by the act of baptism. At this point, one puts on Christ. And once that occurs, this individual is now a member of the church. And now the personal identity of that individual is irrelevant. We are all one and heirs to the promise of Abraham. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's no bond or free. Now, certainly there are different roles it says there's neither male nor female. We don't lose our gender, but we lose any sort of inequality before God. You take this to a little bit more broad of a scope. The Jews would lose their identity as being the children of the patriarchs, which would be much more important because now they're spiritually the children of God, and they're able to say that they're Abraham's seed according to the promise. And the Gentiles would have this right as well. Third, how is Jesus the Lion of Judah? Currently, Jesus is being praised by his brethren. We are his brethren as Christians. We praise him. We praise God. But there will come a day where all who have ever existed will praise him. We all give an account to God. Romans chapter 14, 11. There it says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. But also, all those, not, that, that's somewhat limited to Christians, but although also everyone throughout time will praise him. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, that's Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Even the most rank of atheists will confess that Christ exists, that Christ is the Son of God. However, at this time, it will be too late for that individual to change course. Nonetheless, every knee shall bow and confess Christ. 
because Jesus later on, Jesus will appear as a lion in the sense of dominance over his enemies. When the world ends, he will bring vengeance upon all those who have rebelled. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verses six through 10. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. A, pic uh, a picture of this is painted in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. It adds insight to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, where it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So when Jesus comes back, he will put all his enemies below him. He'll, he'll bring vengeance upon them as was prophesied really by the blessing of Jacob. The lion of the tribe of Jacob, or excuse me, Judah, will have dominance over his enemies. One such enemy would be death. He is the victor over death because death could not hold him. He had no sin. Now, we have studied about another title that Jesus was given, and again, that is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. While many of him, many think of him as only the Lamb of God and really focus on the more positive sides, if you will, such as Savior, Lamb of God, or Mediator, there is much more to Jesus and most that more, more to Jesus than people wish to think about because it's such a negative thing. People think the truth is negative nowadays, and especially when Jesus is bringing vengeance upon them. There is a standard of truth, and as we pointed out earlier, the key to this, to being on the Lord's side, is ultimately being baptized and living faithful to him, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. It's the only way we will escape being his enemy and thereby receiving his perfect vengeance when this world is over. Thank you for your attention. I hope this has been beneficial.